Hello, I am Mati Vanouf. I'm currently a postdoc at NYU Abu Dhabi, and later this year I will start as a professor at KU Leuven. Today I will be presenting frag attacks, aggregation on fragmentation flaws in Wi-Fi. If we look at the history of Wi-Fi security, we can see that initially Wi-Fi provided the web security protocol. Unfortunately, it was quickly shown to be horribly broken. In response, WPA and WPA2 were released. However, these two protocols were vulnerable to offline dictionary attacks. And a few years ago, I also showed that they are vulnerable to key reinstallation attacks. So the crack attack and also the small improvement of the crack attack, the Kraken attack. Just a year ago, academic researchers showed that the defenses against crack are formally secure, meaning Existing implementations of web on WPA2 should now provide defenses against the key reinstallation attack. Additionally, three years ago, the Wi-Fi Alliance released WPA3, and WPA3 provides a new handshake to prevent offline dictionary attacks, and this means that WPA3 is a major improvement upon WPA2. Unfortunately, together with AL Ronan, we demonstrated that the Dragonfly handshake of WPA3 is vulnerable to the so-called Dragonblood side channel leaks. In response, the Wi-Fi Alliance now requires certified devices to implement defenses against the Dragonblood attack. I also want to highlight that once a client has connected to either a WPA2 or WPA3 network, the encryption used to protect data frames is practically identical. And this also means that attacks in this presentation will work against both WPA2 and WPA3. In late the 2020, two extra defenses were also added to the standard that underpins Wi-Fi, and these are called operating channel validation and beacon protection. Now these two defenses would make our attacks harder, but not impossible would just require more skill to pull them off. Additionally, these defenses are still undergoing adoption in practice, meaning right now these two defenses unfortunately don't yet have practical impact. So we can see that in the past few years, some major advancements have in fact been made to the security of Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, in this work I'm going to present three new design flaws on several related implementation flaws. And I will begin by explaining the design flaws, and in particular I will first explain the aggregation design flaw. To explain this flaw, I first have to explain how aggregation works in a Wi-Fi network. And in a Wi-Fi network, if you want to send small packets, that causes a lot of overhead. And this is because every small packet shown in green here needs to have its individual Wi-Fi header. It needs to be individually acknowledged by the receiver. On between every packet, there needs to be a small delay. And that causes a lot of overhead. And in practice, it's much more efficient to aggregate these small packets into one larger Wi-Fi frame. The question then becomes, how can a receiver know whether a packet contains just a single network packet or whether a Wi-Fi frame contains multiple network packets. And the answer is quite straightforward. The Wi-Fi header contains a flag that indicates whether the encrypted payload contains just a single network packet or whether it contains an aggregation of multiple network packets. So if this flag is true, the encrypted payload will first start with some metadata about the first packet, then the length of the first packet, the actual content of the first packet, then the metadata about the second packet, and so on. Now what is the design flaw here? The design flaw is that this header is not authenticated. This means that an adversary can, for instance, take a normal Wi-Fi frame and turn it into an aggregated Wi-Fi frame without the receiver realizing this. And this means that the decrypted content of the packet will be parsed in an unexpected manner. And we showed that this can be abused to inject arbitrary packets to the victim. Now before explaining the technical details, 
Let me first explain the attack scenario in which case this vulnerability can be exploited. So here we have a client on the left that is connected to the access point on the right and we have an adversary that has established a special multi-channel man in the middle position between the client and the access point. Now this multi-channel man in the middle position does not require the password of the network. This position can be established against any protected Wi-Fi network as long as the adversary is within range. This man in the middle does not allow the adversary to currently decrypt packets. It only allows the adversary to reliably block or modify encrypted frames. The second step is that the victim is tricked into downloading an image from the attacker's server. This causes the victim device to establish a TCP connection with the web server of the adversary. This can for example be accomplished by sending an email to the victim with an embedded image that is hosted on the server of the adversary or by sending the vi victim a WhatsApp or linked or signal message that causes the message app to show a preview of the website and that means the device is again initiating a TCP connection with the server of the adversary. Once this TCP connection is established, the adversary will send a specially crafted TCP IPv4 packet over this connection. And I will explain later how exactly this packet is constructed. For now, this packet is sent as normal to the client, meaning at some point it will arrive at the legitimate access point. The legitimate access point will encrypt it as a normal frame and forward it to the client. Before this Wi-Fi frame arrives at the client, the adversary will set the isAggregated flag in the Wi-Fi header. And I want to remark here that the adversary cannot modify the encrypted content of the frame. The adversary can only abuse this design flaw in Wi-Fi to change the isAggregated flag in the header. However, because we constructed this IPv4 packet in a special manner, this will allow us to inject arbitrary packets towards the victim. So we can, for instance, inject an R packet, a DHCP packet, and so on. And we can also inject an ICMP v6 router advertisement that will trick the victim into using a malicious DNS server. Now, although this attack might look complicated, I want to remark that this condition uh, in order to exploit the attack is in fact easier than the well-known beast time on the heist attack against TLS. This is because these attacks against TLS require the victim to execute malicious JavaScript, while in our case we only require that the victim will establish a TCP connect connection with the adversary. So that means our attack is simpler than these attacks against TLS. Additionally, if the router is vulnerable to a common implementation flaw, then instead of sending the special IPv4 packet, we can directly send a special handshake frame to the access point, and the vulnerable access point will then forward this handshake message to the victim, and we can then execute the attack without any social engineering, simply by being within range of the victim. And this vulnerability was present in two out of four home access points that we tested. Now you may still be wondering how exactly this can be abused to inject any type of network packet, but I'll explain that later. First, let's look at the demonstration of this attack in practice. Note that this recorded demonstration will be a bit more fast paced than the presentation to assure I won't run out of time. Our target will be a macOS laptop. This laptop is connected to a protected Wi-Fi network as indicated by the lock symbol and the victim will use it to visit websites such as nyu.edu. Notice that the homepage of this website is insecure. However, the login page does use HTTPS as an extra layer of security as indicated by the lock symbol. Before starting the attack, we have to prepare it by running the following script on a server. This script waits for connections from the victim and I'll explain its purpose later. On this server, I'm also running a DNS on the web server to intercept and impersonate websites. 
I'll also run Wireshark to capture traffic towards the server. We can now start the attack with the following tool. Here I included the protected Wi-Fi network that will be attacked and that we will only target one specific victim. The tool starts by searching for this Wi-Fi network and then it clones this network on a different channel. This malicious clone of the network enables the attacker to reliably manipulate encrypted data frames, which is required to abuse the design flaw. When the victim now enables Wi-Fi, it will connect to the malicious clone. To better understand the attack, I'll also start Wireshark on the victim. We must now trick the victim into connecting to the attacker's server. Here this is accomplished by sending an email to the victim, and although this email looks innocent, it contains a hidden image hosted on the server of the attacker. This causes the victim to download the image from the attacker's server, but instead of sending the image, the attacker will send a malicious TCP packet. This packet is constructed in such a way so that when it's turned into an aggregated Wi-Fi frame, it will cause the injection of a frame that tricks the victim into using our malicious DNS server. The Wi-Fi attacker can detect this packet based on its length and it will set the aggregated flag in the Wi-Fi header before forwarding it to the victim. Due to a design flaw in Wi-Fi, the victim won't notice that the attacker changed this flag. As a result, the victim will process the modified frame and will start using our malicious DNS server. Looking at the victim, we can indeed see that it received a frame containing the malicious DNS server. Note that normally we cannot inject such frames over a TCP connection. This is only possible by abusing design flaws in Wi-Fi. When the victim again visits an insecure website such as nyu.edu, our malicious DNS server will redirect the victim to our own copy of the website. This copy contains a link to an insecure login page and Safari is in fact warning us that we may not be on the real website. However, most users likely won't notice this and will enter their username and password. Because I'm using a fake username and password, the login fails. Nevertheless, when looking at the captured traffic on the attacker's server, we can search for the victim's login attempt and extract the username and password. You may now be wondering how many devices are affected. And unfortunately, I have bad news here. All major operating systems are affected, with the exception of NetBSD on some IoT devices which do not support aggregate Wi-Fi frames. Now, one thing I did not yet explain is how this special IPv4 packet is constructed, and it is constructed in the following way. So first we create an IPv4 packet with the following header and with the following length. Then we can pick an arbitrary IP identification value. We have the remaining IP header and then the TCP header. And finally, we put the frame that we want to inject in the data field of the TCP packet. Now, we can control the fields in green here. We can put arbitrary values there as an attacker, but for the red fields, we must use a certain value because if we do not use this value, the IPv4 packet will not reach the client. Now, when sending this IPv4 packet, when it arrives at a legitimate access point, the legitimate access point will add an extra header and then it will encrypt all this data and send it as a Wi-Fi frame. Now here we're going to assume that the access point will send it as a normal individual frame and then the adversary will turn this frame into an aggregate frame. On the receiver, the receiver will now think that these first bytes are the metadata of the first packet. Now this will result in invalid metadata, meaning that the first sub-packet will in fact be ignored. Now what's very interesting here though, is that the length of this first sub-packet corresponds exactly to the IP identification field. And as an adversary, we can put any value we want there, meaning we can fully control how long this first sub-packet is, meaning we can control where the second sub-packet starts. In other words, we can fully control the metadata, the length, and the content of the second subpacket, meaning as long as we control the IP identification field on the subset of the TCP data, then by turning this normal frame into an aggregate frame, 
we can in fact inject any packet that we want. So that's how the attack works in detail. Let me now move on to the mixed key attack. And I first have to explain how fragmentation works. And this is because both the mixed key and the fragment cache attack rely on Wi-Fi fragmentation. Now, with Wi-Fi fragmentation, we have the opposite problem as before. Here we have a Wi-Fi packet that is too large. And if there is then a lot of background noise, then there's a high chance this packet will be corrupted and we have to transmit all the data again. And here it is more efficient if there is background noise to fragment large packets into smaller ones so that if a fragment is lost, we only need to retransmit that one specific fragment. Now the question becomes how can a receiver properly and securely reassemble these fragments back to the original frame? But let me first explain this for plain text Wi-Fi frames using this example here where we have three fragments. The first information that we need is that every Wi-Fi frame has a sequence count number S. And here every fragment has the same sequence number S so that we can identify fragments that belong to the same original frame. Additionally, every frame contains a fragment number that allows us to determine the order of the fragments. And finally, there is a flag to indicate what the last fragment is. And with these fields, we can reliably and properly reconstruct the original fragment for a plain text, so an open Wi-Fi network. For a protected Wi-Fi network, there is another field that is added to the Wi-Fi header, and this is the so-called packet number. And this packet number is used at the encryption lay to, for instance, prevent replays. Now when fragmentation is used, every fragment must have a consecutive packet number. So here the first fragment has packet number n. That means that the second fragment must have packet number n plus 1 and the third must have packet number n plus 2. And if that is not the case, the fragment should be dropped. Now all these fields except the sequence number are authenticated, meaning an adversary cannot modify these flags because if the adversary does that, the receiver will detect this and the frame or fragment will be dropped. On that first sight, this actually seems quite secure. However, problems begin when fragmentation is combined with the session key renewal. Now what is session key renewal? Well, a client can periodically refresh the key that it is using to encrypt data frames by performing the handshake again. And this will update the session key that is used to encrypt data frames. And the session key will also be automatically re renewed when the client roams from one access point to another. And when the session key is renewed, the packet numbers that a sender is using will also restart back from zero. Now, why is this a problem? Well, without yet going into too much detail, the problem is that a receiver will reassemble fragments that are encrypted using different keys after one of these session key renewals took place. So let me illustrate that graphically. Let's say we have our client on access point here and our again our adversary that has this multi-channel man in the middle position. In our attack, we assume that the client will send a Wi-Fi frame that is split into two fragments and the adversary will block the second fragment, meaning only the first fragment is forwarded to the access point. Then at some point the client will refresh the session key from K to M. So notice that these frames here on top are encrypted using the key K. But when the Wi-Fi client now refreshes the session key, the packet numbers will be reset to zero. And when it now sends another fragmented frame, the adversary will block the first fragment from arriving and will only forward the second fragment to the access point. And because of the design flaw in Wi-Fi, 
the access point will reassemble both of these fragments, even though they belong to different frames, and even though they were decrypted using a different key K. In other words, as an adversary, we can abuse this design flaw to mix the content of two different frames. So what is the impact of this in practice? Well, in practice, we can abuse this to exfiltrate data if the client sends fragmented frames, which is relatively rare unless Wi-Fi 6 is used, and we again need to social engineer the victim into connecting to the server of the attacker. A third condition is that the network must also periodically refresh the session key, and that is in fact very rare in practice. However, there is an extremely common implementation flaw that allows us to perform this attack even if the network doesn't refresh the session key. And how can we then exfiltrate data? Well, the idea is that the first frame that we target is a frame that the adversary is sending, sorry, that the victim is sending to the server of the adversary. For instance, we trick the victim to download an image from our server. And the second fragment contains sensitive information that the user is sending. For instance, here we assume that the user is logging in on a plain text HTTP website. And using our mixed key attack, we can now mix the content of both of these frames. In other words, we can construct an IP packet with as destination the server of the adversary and as content sensitive user data. And that essentially means that sensitive data is now sent to the server of the adversary, meaning we learn the password of the victim. So that concludes the mixed key attack. I will now very briefly also explain the fragment cache design flaw. And what goes wrong here is that fragments are not removed from memory after the receiver has disconnected. So let me illustrate this using the following example where we are targeting an enterprise Wi-Fi network such as Ethereum or Hotspot 2.0 where users mutually distrust each other. In that case, in these kinds of networks, the adversary can also connect to this network because the adversary has a personal username and password. And then the adversary can inject a malicious fragment into the memory of the access point. So the access point will decrypt this fragment sent by the adversary and store it in memory. When the adversary now disconnects, due to the design flaw, this fragment stays in the memory of the access point meaning if the client now connects to the access point, then it becomes possible that fragments sent by the victim, sent by the client here, will be reassembled together with the malicious fragment of the adversary. And then things go wrong. And what exactly can go wrong? Well, we can abuse this to again exfiltrate data or possibly to inject packets assuming we are, we are targeting a network where users distrust each other and assuming that the client sends fragmented frames, which is fairly rare unless Wi-Fi 6 is being used. Now, what I do want to remark here is that even the very old web protocol is affected by this design flaw and web was in fact also affected by the mixed key attack that I just explained. And this really shows that these design flaws have been part of Wi-Fi since a very long time. Now, how do we fix these design flaws? Well, for the aggregation design flaw, ideally we authenticate the isAggregated flag. Unfortunately, this will not be backwards compatible. Instead, vendors are now preventing known attacks by the following defense. In particular, what vendors are doing is they are trying to detect when an adversary takes the following normal frame and the adversary turns it into an aggregated frame. Because in that case, the metadata of the aggregate frame will start with a valid RFC 1042 header. And 
If that is the case, then it is extremely likely that an attack is going on where an adversary turns this normal frame into an aggregated one. Unfortunately, that does mean that the true root cause of the vulnerability is not fixed, so it could be that someone in the future might be able to bypass this, this ad hoc defense. For the mixed key attack, there the solution is to only reassemble fragments that are decrypted under the same key. And for the fragment cache attack, there a receiver should clear unused fragments from memory when either the client disconnects or when the corresponding key that was used to decrypt this fragment is removed. Now apart from these design flaws, I also discovered very common implementation flaws. And the first set of implementation flaws allow an adversary to inject plain text packets. In particular, by sending a plain text packet that is either fragmented or broadcasted, or by sending this plain text packet while connecting, a vulnerable device will accept this plain text frame even when the device is connected to a protected Wi Fi network. And there are many vulnerable devices, for instance, Apple on some Android devices are vulnerable, Windows, some network cards on Windows are vulnerable, home and professional access points are vulnerable, and so on. And this vulnerability can be used to trivially inject packets. And I will now show a recorded demo where this is abused to remotely turn on and off a power socket. This power socket can be manually turned on and off, but can also be controlled over Wi-Fi. As an attacker, we can detect such power sockets based on their MAC address. Without knowing the password of the Wi-Fi network, the implementation flaw allows an attacker to easily inject packets into the Wi-Fi network. Because the power socket doesn't use a separate password on top of Wi-Fi, this allows the adversary to remotely turn on and off the power socket. Another common implementation flaw is the so-called cloaked AMSDU attack. How does this attack work? Well, to perform this attack, the adversary sends the following Wi-Fi frame as an aggregated frame. So the is aggregated flag is true, and as content of the frame, we first start with the following magic bytes, and then at the end of the packet, we include the packet that we want to inject into the network. Now, how will a normal receiver process this frame? Well, a normal receiver will first deaggregate this frame, and it will result in the following two packets. The first packet here will be ignored because the metadata of this packet corresponds to these magic bytes, and that's in fact invalid meta metadata, meaning this first subpacket is ignored. The second subpacket has valid metadata, however, it is sent in plain text and it does not correspond to a handshake frame because it looks like a normal data frame and therefore the su second subpack is, subpacket is also dropped. Now the problem is that a vulnerable device will switch the order of these two operations. So a vulnerable device will first check if a plain text frame is a handshake frame and in this case the frame indeed corresponds to the magic bytes of a handshake frame, meaning the full frame is now accepted. And only after this does a vulnerable implementation deaggregate the frame, meaning only after accepting the frame does it split this aggregated frame into the two subpackets. Now this first subpacket is still ignored, however the second subpacket, which remember is sent in plain text, is now accepted. And this means that we as an adversary can abuse this vulnerability to inject plain text packets into a protected Wi-Fi network and the root cause is that implementations do these operations in the wrong order. Surprisingly many devices are affected, for example FreeBSD, some Windows dongles, three out of four home routers and even one professional access point. And I'll now show a recorded demo where the cloaked AMSDU flaw allows an attacker to inject packets towards the router. More precisely, in this demo the cloaked AMSDU vulnerability will be abused to punch a hole in the router's firewall so that the attacker can connect with and attack devices in the victim's home network.
In our case, the target is an outdated Windows 7 computer that is vulnerable to Bluekeep. This computer is inside a local network, meaning someone on the internet cannot directly access it. However, the following script will punch a hole in the router's firewall such that an attacker on the internet can connect to local devices behind it. First though, I'll connect to the server and I'll start Wireshark to capture any traffic that is sent towards it. Going back to the Wi-Fi attacker, we can see that the script injects a plain text aggregated Wi-Fi frame that looks like an Eopol handshake message. This causes a vulnerable device to accept the injected frame even though it's not encrypted. The frame is nevertheless processed as an aggregated Wi-Fi frame, meaning we can sneak in a TCP packet inside the aggregated frame. This TCP packet punches a hole in the router's firewall and is eventually received by the attacker. From this we learn the public IP address on port that can be used to access the Windows 7 machine. We'll abuse this to take over the outdated Windows 7 machine by exploiting Bluekeep. We first configure Metasploit with the IP address on port and then run the exploit. Once the exploit completed, we can monitor what the user is typing, which we illustrate by stealing the login and password of the victim. As another example, it's also possible to take a screenshot of the Windows machine to see what the victim is doing. Finally, it's also possible to execute any program on the victim's machine, which here is illustrated by starting the calculator. I also discovered various other implementation flaws, and I'll highlight a few of them. First, I found that various vulnerable implementations only require the last fragment to be encrypted. And this is, for example, the case for many network cards on Windows on Linux. And with this vulnerability, it becomes more easy to perform the aggregation on cache attack design flaw. On the other hand, some implementations accept fragmented frames even if only the last fragment is encrypted. And then it becomes trivial to inject packets into the network on, for example, free and NetBSD is affected by this. Another vulnerability is that many receivers don't check whether fragments are consecutive. Remember that normally fragments of the same frame must have this consecutive packet number. However, in practically all implementations except Linux, they do not perform this check meaning we can mix fragments of different frames or put differently, we can more easily perform the mixed key attack. We also found that devices that do not support fragmentation are rather surprisingly still vulnerable to attacks. For instance, OpenB and OpenBSD and Espressive IoT chips, they treat fragmented frames as full frames and under the right conditions, this can still be abused to inject frames towards them. And this really shows that all implementations are vulnerable, even that those that don't support fragmentation and those that don't support aggregation are still vulnerable to attacks. Now to test if, if a device is vulnerable, I created a test tool and it can detect all the vulnerabilities that I discussed in this presentation. To test if a device is vulnerable, you do need the credentials of the Wi-Fi network. So this is not an attack tool. And this tool can also be used as the basis for future Wi-Fi research. So I do recommend that you check it out. Now I want to discuss a few things. First and for all, why did it took more than two decades to discover these design flaws? I think the first reason is that without modified drivers, the attacks are not possible to perform in practice, so maybe someone had the ID, but was unable to verify their IDs in practice. Second, the fragmentation and aggregation functionality of Wi-Fi were never considered security essential, so nobody really looked at them. There's also some general lessons that we can learn from this. First and for all, we should adopt defenses early, even if the concerns are theoretic, because that, for example, would have prevented the aggregation design flaw. It is also important to properly isolate security context and to properly manage data that was decrypted under different keys. 
And finally, we should keep fuzzing devices. And here the Wi-Fi lines can help. The Wi-Fi lines can, for instance, fuzz devices while they are being certified. Now to disclose these vulnerabilities, I collaborated with the Wi-Fi lines and ICASI through an embargo of roughly nine months. And during this embargo, I even created several updates to the test tool. So to the, in a sense, the proof of concept. And this really shows that this was an exceptional disclosure. And I'm currently still doing some follow-up work. So I'm helping the IEEE with updating the Wi-Fi standard to fix the design flaws. I'm currently maintaining the test tool and also double checking whether vendors are indeed implementing patches. Now looking back, was this long multi-party coordinated disclosures worth it? And well, to my surprise, some companies weren't happy, weren't happy even if they managed to write patches for most devices. And this was a bit disappointing to me because I was actually very happy that most devices got patches because usually that's not the case for Wi-Fi. Fortunately, most vendors did appreciate this long embargo. And here in particular, I want to thank Cisco, Lancome, Aruba, Huawei, Ubiquiti, MediaTek, Samsung, and Netgear for their positive responses. If you are watching a recorded video, you can pause on this slide for the references. And with that, I come to the conclusion. I discovered three design flaws in Wi-Fi and multiple implementation vulnerabilities. In practice, the implementation flaws are the easiest to abuse and the design flaws can be a bit more tricky to abuse. And for more information, you can visit the following URL. Thank you for your attention.